People don't know this. I didn't know this. The number one motivator for human being, it's not sex, it's not drugs, it's not food. The number one motivator for human being is... I cannot imagine a better race than this. I'm addicted. By 2010, after the financial crisis, I'm done. I'm 10 years into this thing. I can't get people to do it. I decide, I don't know why, I decide to take one last stab at this thing. And Spartan became the name. And three months later, uh, we had our first race in Vermont and 700 people showed up. 700 people were more people than I had in the entire 10 years. And then all of a sudden, these orange fucking headbands show up. Tough Mudder, my competitor. Two kids out of Harvard Business School and they are eating our lunch. What it's doing is it's driving me every day. And so I go nuts. We're gonna expand faster than them. And so I move my whole family to Asia. Wait, you moved your family to Asia? to essentially beat the competition. To beat the coming. competition, I, I just don't like to lose. I lost $50 million. So, you know, in the 22 years of doing this, we didn't make $50 million. Yeah, how do you lose $50 million? Um, well. All right, Joe, we got a lot to talk about. I think we're gonna have some fun. Uh, let's give people context though. Spartan, founder, CEO, uh, how big is this business? What do you guys do? How long have you done it, et cetera? definitely done it for too long. Uh, we're 22 years in. This was started um, in 2000. And the idea was, how do, I, how do I inspire the world? How do I get people to do things they otherwise wouldn't do? I had this opinion that I thought there were about 50,000 people globally, men and women, the kind of people that would like row a rowboat across the Atlantic or climb Mount Everest or run 100 miles. And those 50,000 would inspire the rest of us to get up and off the couch, put down the extra cookie, the glass of wine. And so that's where it was, you know, that's where it was first dreamt up back in 2000. And um, I bought the URL peak.com. This, this was early days, folks. Um, there, weren't, there weren't many people thinking about four-letter URLs back then. And I paid, um, I paid a lot for it. I paid a million dollars for, for peak.com. It turned out that the initial iteration of this business, which was, all right, I'm going to put on 350 mile races. I'm going to find some of these 50,000 people. We're going to make them paddle through the British Virgin Islands, all kinds of crazy shit. Um, couldn't get a lot of people to do that. There weren't, there weren't 50,000 people that wanted to do that. And so um, was the name, why was the name peak.com so important to you? A million dollars uh, is a lot of money to pay for it. It's a, a lot of money, without. but I just thought, what a great, name. I, at the time I was racing like a madman all around the world. I was climbing peaks. It yeah. seemed like peak perform. It just seemed like you needed it. It just seemed like I needed it. It seemed like yeah. the right name. I was making money at the time I was on wall street and, um, it was available. And so peak.com was born. Now let's back up. That's, that's 2000 back up to 1973, 74. Um, my mom, her mom gets cancer. And if you've ever seen the movie Goodfellas, I'm, I'm in the neighborhood where Goodfellas was filmed and, and, you know, actual reality took place. I'm ground zero for Goodfellas. And um, that means there's a lot of raviolis, pizza, ganolis, uh, coffee, espresso, cigarettes. That was, that was the lifestyle back then, right? Like if you made it, you had a Cadillac, you had a belly, you had $100 bills in your pocket. Um, it was not about health and wellness. There were no yoga journals. There was no Lululemon, no Whole Foods back then. My mom, her mom gets cancer. My mom goes into the only health food store probably on the East Coast at the time. It's right near Kennedy Airport, which is, again, where Goodfellas was taking place. And um, she meets a yogi, a yogi that just flew in from India. He landed at JFK, goes into this health food store. They're burning incense for those of you that might have been in a health food store back then. Um, they were crunchy, really crunchy, really hippie-ish. And um, this guy convinced her to become a vegan on the spot. Put down the raviolis, forget the sausage and peppers, become a vegan. If you, if you care about your mother, you want to save your mother's life, you got to eat healthy, you got to start meditating, do yoga. And this particular yogi believed in running. And you they, know, all, they all don't believe in running? No, not some of them are really focused on, you know, uh, this discipline or that discipline. Some meditate more, yeah. than, more than yoga. This particular... Um, and, and weightlifting, believe it or not. And so he uh, puts on a race in Queens, New York, called the Transcendence Run, three or four years after he met my mom, so later in the 70s. 
It's a 3,100-mile run around a one-mile loop in Queens, New York. Still exists today. So for 50 or 60 days, you're running around one mile. So anyway, my mom is hook, line, and sinker into this whole new life. Her mom doesn't make it. Her mom dies of cancer. Um, But her and her sister, my aunt, take on this new lifestyle, this new journey. As you can imagine, it did not go well in our house. It did not go well in the neighborhood. We did not want to give up eggplant parm heroes or that lifestyle. I thought my mom was crunchy, weird. And um, my sister felt the same way, and our entire family did. Because it was not um, friendly, she moves to Ithaca, New York. Ithaca, New York is where Cornell University is. Ithaca University, lots of professors, lots of hippies, much more open-minded to my mother's way of life. Um, But I want to get back to the neighborhood. Anyway, so that's the battle I'm going through, right? My mom is pushing that. My dad is hanging out with people with money and cars, and I want more of that and less, less of my mom's stuff. Fast forward, I make it to Wall Street, a miracle. I'm making money, stressed out every day, and I stumble upon these crazy races in the mid-90s, the kind like this 3,100-mile run. And I start doing them, and I feel completely alive. Like, I find that when I get to a place, when we all get to a place where we just want water, food, and shelter— and none of the other nonsense matters, all the things that are in our head and spinning wheels every day, and they're so important, I got this problem, I got that problem, is all gone. The only thing you want is water, food, and shelter. You're cold, you're tired, you're hungry. And um, and that's a really refreshing place to be, and I fall in love with it, and it creates change. And and so I'm living this life now, the kind that my mother was preaching. I'm, I'm bought in now on this, I'm doing yoga, I'm preaching to everybody to eat only raw foods. I've completely, you know, done a 180 on Wall Street. And what I'm finding is that when I rope in my friends and would-be clients, we all, we all want to do more business in life if we're in business, um, I build relationships that are unbreakable. Not like the kind when you go to dinner and have some drinks. Everybody go to dinner. When you, do, when you do one of these races. When I do a race with yeah. a client or a potential client, I build bonds. We go through war together. You never forget, yeah. Never forget. And so, um, so I'm, I'm like, this is an interesting thing for the world to really get. Like, I, I want to do something here. So fast forward, I'm, I'm racing all over the world. I'm doing these crazy things. I'm bought into it. I'm pushing it on everybody I know. And um, – and I'm having more fun in life because of it. And so I said in 2000, 22 years ago, I'm going to turn this into a business. I buy peak.com, try to make it work. 25 people show up for the first race. I lose a ton of money. Very few people, a second race, a third race. And for a decade, while I'm still making money on Wall Street, I'm continuing to light money on fire and try to make this thing work. And do you know what you're doing at this point? Or are you basically just like looking back now, right? After doing all of these things, was it basically, I just like this. I'm going to try to put them on and get people here. Were you marketing it correctly? Like how did that work? Well, first lesson, if we're doing business lessons here was um, focus. I, my main business was sitting on a trading desk and, and handling, yeah. you know, hedge funds and, and, and banks derivative and equity orders. That was my main focus all day, every day. My side project was this peak.com thing. So number one, I wasn't focused on it. Number two, the world wasn't ready for it. Um, I knew there was something there, but like the iPhone hadn't been fully developed yet. Facebook wasn't around, like just wasn't ready yet. By 2010, after the financial crisis, um, I'm done. I'm 10 years into this thing. I can't get people to do it. I don't know what I know now about human behavior, which we could talk about, and um, I'm packing it in. I bought a farm in Vermont with my wife. We got kids and goats and chickens, and I don't need this nonsense. And I decide, I don't know why, I decide to take one last stab at this thing. I'm going to change the format against my better instinct. We're going we're gonna to make it more military-inspired. I see that back you know, in the 1700s, 1800s, There's imagery, believe it or not, pencil drawings of obstacle courses. Um, The French were training their military with rope climbs and so forth. And all right, we're going to make a military-inspired obstacle course. We're going to change the name from peak.com to I don't know what. We're going to write a whole list of names down. We'll sit in the kitchen tonight, and we'll see what name pops off the shelf. It pops up in our our mind as the best name. And um, we'll do one in Vermont, and if it works— We'll do it. If not, I'm done. And um, 
And Spartan became the name. And three months later, uh, we had our first race in Vermont and 700 people showed up. 700 people were more people than I had in the entire 10 years preceding um, that moment. And so I was like, wow, there's something here. And I happened to have a guy with me who worked for Discovery Channel, who was the guy that would figure out for Discovery Channel if there was a good show concept or not, right? So he had a little psychology expertise. And he said, oh my God, do you see what's happening here? I was like, yeah. He goes, people are literally transforming in front of us from the start line to the finish line. And it was everything I had felt in all my races, but I was seeing it. I was like, there's something here. So then we had the second race and a third race and a fourth race. And what were people doing though in the first race? Is it the same as, as today? It was an obstacle course kind of thing. And- it was obstacle course, but I, but I'm a crazy person. You yeah. don't know, you don't know. It me. sounds like you, like the first version was very difficult and you might've made it easier, but you tell me. I definitely made it easier. I mean, the first version was 350 miles long. Yeah. This version That's was- That's probably three, why a lot of people didn't show up. Yeah. This version <laughs> was three and a half miles long. This version, it, you know, in the first version, you might be paddling for three days straight. That becomes boring, very arduous, difficult. In this version, you're never running more than, you know, a quarter mile before you face some obstacle. You get to stop for a second, challenge yourself. And then, and so the monotony was broken up. Um, the distance wasn't as long. It felt military inspired. Oh, and by the way, Facebook was now big. Oh, and by the way, there were a bunch of veterans coming back from the Middle East. Oh, and by the way, CrossFit was becoming big. So it was like a perfect storm. Everything came together. 700 people, 1,500 people, 4,000 people. And then all of a sudden, these orange fucking headbands show up. Tough Mudder, my competitor. Two kids out of Harvard Business School. They're smarter than I am. They've got this whole thing figured out digitally, and they are eating our lunch. And... um. And it's what it's doing is it's driving me every day. Like I think competitors are like, it's driving me to be an absolute maniac and not lose this, this game. And so I go nuts and we're going to expand faster than them. And so I move my whole family to Asia and, uh, and then I move my family, uh, to Canada and we just move around the world, building out the brand. Wait, you moved your family to Asia to essentially beat the competition. To beat the competition. I I just don't like to lose. And so we just, we moved around the world and we um, expanded the brand and we had an amazing trip with the family and such a learning experience and uh, great foods. Um, Singapore, Japan, China, came back to Canada, Vancouver. And and we had just a blast and we built this giant business. In 2019, Right before the pandemic, I had the opportunity to buy out the competitor, Tough Mudder. Um, they, had, they had a massive balance sheet issue. So we bought them and uh, we were pounding our chest that we're geniuses and we're on top of the world. And finally, after 22 years, I proved I was right. And the pandemic, the pandemic came and hit, hit us and um, shut us down. Yeah, um, this seems like a business that would have been hit exceptionally hard by the pandemic. I don't think there's a worse business. Like planes were still flying. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There were there were no events. We got shut down everywhere. Did and you, did you try to do anything out of the ordinary? Like I'm assuming you attempted to give tests on site and and run races. Was that not allowed? We weren't allowed to have events. Half of my community, if it was you know at that time, ten million people, half, five million people, uh, called for Joe's head, Joe, to be executed because he was attempting to put on events and kill people. And this was too dangerous. And then the other half wanted to kill me because Joe wasn't putting on events. And we had bought tickets and we were training. And it's ridiculous that Joe would kowtow to the government and make people wear masks. And this is ridiculous. And so uh, there was no way to win. It didn't didn't matter what we did. um, They wanted to kill it. People weren't happy. They were stuck in their homes and right, their lives had been completely disrupted. We had already sold close to a half a million tickets when the world shut down. So those half a million people, you could imagine, you know, surrounded my house with torches and wanted to tar and feather me. Um, we dug our way through somehow. We, um, we made it out the other side. And in 2022, this year, the beginning of the year, we went for it in a big way. And we, we launched, uh, in about 40 countries, we stood everything back up and, um, quickly found ourselves in a really precarious situation because we weren't starting like we did 20 years ago where you you have one event and then two events and then three events and you gain momentum. We were starting from complete hibernation and shutdown 
to, you know, 300 events around the world. And that's incredibly expensive. Yeah. I mean, Cirque du Soleil couldn't do it. Right. I, I was going to ask, uh, about the, the economics, not only of the business, but like of an actual event, right? Because I imagine that this is a uh, pretty low margin. You have to deal with a lot of things that people don't think about, whether it's insurance, obviously renting areas or venues or land or whatever it is, a million different things go into it. Can you talk a little bit about just like one event, how that works from a business perspective? Yeah. What people don't realize is uh, 12 months in advance, you're going to book the venue, right? So you've got to spend whatever huge money to rent that venue. Um, you've got to have a bunch of employees hired so that they're working on that 12 months in advance. You've got to have insurance 12 months in advance for that event coming up. You've got to have six to eight tractor trailers in advance of that. You've got to order 8,000 shirts and medals 12 months in advance, right? You've got to have food ready. We've got to have staff. We've got to have 600 volunteers that have to be fed and set up and have shirts. Like, so all these things start happening 12 months in advance. And where people don't understand the event business is the day of, there's, you're not making any money. It's all spent or like all that money has gone. So it's, it's only after many years and gaining momentum and having lots of events and having a well-oiled machine does the whole thing start to work. Um, but I think there's a misconception um, from civilians where it's like, oh, well, there was a hurricane. You didn't host the event. So you, you give us our you know, money back. Well, but we spent all the money. Yeah. Right. So, so if we had 400,000 plus people that bought tickets and then the world gets shut down, I got to give all those people a refund, like an, an ability to go use that ticket at a future race. And so that means when I hold that future race, there's no revenue coming in. I already, I already received and burned that revenue. Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah. So, um, and I'm assuming the people that you had set these races up with the vendors, right. You know, renting the land, whatever they're it is, not refined, they're, they're, they're not, not paying you yeah, back. Yeah. No, it doesn't, doesn't work that way. So I guess my, I'm not complaining at all. I've got the greatest life in the world. I get to change people's lives. Um, I get the most amazing stories. You, you, you got me back with my husband. You got me back with my kids. You got me back with my wife. I lost a hundred pounds. I gave up drinking. I no longer do drugs. I didn't kill myself. I was planning, literally had a trigger pulled, right? Gun at my head and remembered, oh, I got a Spartan race next week. Don't do it. I'll wait till after the race. You save my, like the stories I get are so unbelievable. And why do you think that people do that though, right? Why do you think it transforms people? Because most people probably think that haven't done one, uh, think that sounds terrible, right? That sounds tough. That doesn't sound like something that's going to save me. Why do you think it does that instead of the opposite? Well, I have a podcast and I've um, interviewed about 700 neuroscientists, biologists, psychologists, you name it. And I didn't have the knowledge I have now because of that, right? I got to talk to all these experts. And, you know, just to, to say it simply, change does not occur unless you're under pressure. You don't change eating popcorn, watching Netflix, right? You, you, you don't change having a, a great meal in a climate controlled, beautiful apartment. Like it's gotta be tough. You gotta be going through hell yeah. to change. You know, that's why they say addicts, alcoholics have to hit rock bottom. They've got to be under tremendous pain and suffering to make that change. Right. Um, companies remain status quo. They don't change unless they're going through hell, unless something shocks the system. So whether an individual or an organization, an ant, we don't change unless we're forced to change. Um, the number one motivator, people don't know this. I didn't know this. The number one motivator for human being, it's not sex. It's not drugs, not food. The number one motivator for human being is the avoidance of discomfort. And the reason that is, is our brains require so much energy to operate that everything is a threat to the brain. I want to go work out. Oh, don't do that. We're going to waste too much energy. We need the energy for the brain to operate right? Oh, I'm going to go, don't, don't do that. Don't wake up early. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I like to think that it's the same reason there's 50 companies trying to see if they can get you groceries in five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Right. right? And it, well, th think about it. They've got so much, um, um, so much of an advantage over what we sell at Spartan because, uh, they're selling less discomfort. I'm selling more discomfort. I'm selling the very thing that everybody's brains are saying you don't want. 
So, um, so, so you have to educate people to understand basically that that is what they need, not necessarily what they want. Yeah, and I would and I would argue if this was you know the 1700s, if you and I were sitting here in the 1700s with a couple of cups and strings instead of microphones, I would say I would be selling couches and penicillin and comfort and Netflix and popcorn because back then life was fucking hard. Yeah. Right now life is so easy. Um, that we need, and I need to educate people, we need discomfort. We need um, change and disruption in order to be better. I mean, the simplest analogy, the simplest way to think about it is, um, let's use you and I as an example. Um, You grow up, you're a plant, I'm a plant. We're both plants in, in my analogy. You grow up on the side of a mountain, your roots wrap around a rock, and you're in a storm every day. I grew up in a greenhouse. I'm watered, the temperature's perfect, sunlight comes in when it's supposed to. When we're both let loose, I don't make it. Yeah. You do. You live this way. All right? It's that scene in, in Batman where, um, what's his name? Bane? Mm-hmm. Right? I, li- I, I, I was born in the darkness, right? Yeah. Like, so, so, and by the way, think about all the characters we love in books and movies and TV shows. Those are badasses. That we love. Those people that can stand up against anything and just push through. Well, have it, have, by the way, we're all gritty. We're all resilient, right? No, it's oh. the same thing in sports, though, right? If you think about the stories they always tell you uh, when you're watching a game or at the NFL draft, right? It feels like the NFL draft's a good example. Right. Someone goes up on stage, they get selected. Uh, next thing you know, they start telling you their life story about how difficult their life was growing up. And it's seen as this positive for them rather than a negative because why? They went through tough shit. Right. Rather than their life was easy, they went to prep school, they had everything given to them and all of that. It's seen as a positive because teams know that they're resilient, they can deal with these things, and et cetera. There's no, there's no, there's no doubt about it. The, the stories we love are, are those stories where that person has been incredibly uncomfortable and, and somehow grinded through. So that's what we sell. We sell discomfort. We sell commitment. We sell discipline. Tough thing to sell. Do you think most people um, are inherently lazy? I think everybody's inherently lazy. I think um, I'm inherently lazy. No one would believe that about me, but um, you but just I am. make a choice every day to basically go against that. Yeah, and so everybody, anybody that's listening right now is saying, "Oh, well, Joe, I don't have the motivation." I've been listening to this for 45 years, um, literally 45 years, listening to everybody around. Me. I don't have the motivation to do it, and I don't have the motivation either. But but what I did, what you have to do if you're listening to this, you have to flip the script. So for me, the pain is worse if I don't do the workout. It's worse if I don't prepare tonight for tomorrow. It's worse if I'm not on time for the meeting. I make the pain worse by not doing the uncomfortable thing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like I'm embarrassed, right? I purposely, I purposely in front of people like you on microphones, shout from the rooftops that no, I wake up early. No, I take cold showers. No, I do the hard things. And by saying that publicly, when I don't do it because I'm lazy, I'm embarrassed. And that's painful. So you've got to flip, you've got to flip the script. You've got to, you've got to change your story, start telling yourself and everybody around you who you are based on who you want to be, not who you are based on how easy it is to be that person, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Do you have kids? I do. How do you um establish this in them, right? I imagine that's pretty difficult. You've built a successful business. They probably have uh, a difficult life relative to what you had growing up and so forth. How do you establish those same, that work ethic or those ethics in them? Very, very tricky. I mean, the, 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 the negative with being somewhat successful, and I would just say I'm somewhat successful and it depends on the day, um, is that my kids have a nicer house and they have an easier life and they go to a nicer school. Um, and, and there's a big downside. They have phones at a very young age, right? And there's a big downside to that. So I've manufactured adversity in their life and, and everybody around them's life by, I was going through it with my daughters last night. My daughters uh, didn't want to wake up. They did two practices yesterday and they didn't want to wake up and do soccer practice this morning. And I said, um, the boys do wrestling twice a day. The boys are, are literally have 12 workouts a week, in addition to every day doing Mandarin, in addition to all their homework, in addition to the 40 other things we make them do. And so, um, but you don't have to, you don't have to wake up for practice. No big deal. 
Um, but then you don't get all the benefits. You don't get the phone anymore. You don't get this. Oh my God, I can't believe you're always mean to me. And this, like, I'm mean to you. Like, like you eat every, like, what are you talking? And so the way I look at it is I'm really not there to be their friend. That's not my job. My job isn't so that my kids run around and tell everybody, oh, how great. No, my job is to raise adults. And, and even though I sound like a crazy person, even though it sounds like I push my kids harder than most, I would say I don't push hard enough because I still love them to death. I would do anything for them. And, and you know, if I was really into it and I was really aggressive, we'd be living in India. We would go to the worst neighborhood or we would be in a favela in Brazil and they'd be growing up in tents. Then, you know, that would be the right thing to do. So e even this manufactured advert, you know, big deal. I make them carry kettle kettlebells up a mountain or like, it's no big deal. If anything happens, I got them. Yeah. We're a phone call away. Like, it's no big deal. What's the hardest thing you've done physically? I go back and forth. There's, there's two instances of, of uh, real PTSD for me. One was um, the Iditarod, um, the dog sled race in Alaska. I did by foot, um, 30 below in the winter, waist deep snow. It was an absolute- What do you mean you did by foot? Well, I didn't have the dogs. There were no, no, no <laughs> dogs for, for that. And, and um, you know- Why'd you do that? 30 below temperatures. I, I, um, I was just in this mode of wanting to know, was I tough enough, you know, test myself? How, how far could I go? Could, could something uh, get me to quit and break? And, um, and I just loved being in a place where I wanted water, food, and shelter. Like I described earlier, it was a very mm -hmm. peaceful place to be. And then another one was by accident. Um, people ask me all the time, oh, Joe, can we go run this race together, do this? That? And I always say yes, right? Everybody's always testing me. Um, but by accident, I had, I had said yes to three different people, three different events that all occurred on the same week. So I had said yes to a 100-mile um, run in Vermont called the Vermont 100 on a Sunday or Saturday to Sunday. And then on a Wednesday, a race in, in Death Valley called Badwater. And then on the next Saturday, a race called um, Ironman Lake Placid. So I had, I don't know, it was four weeks out and I realized, oh my God, I triple booked myself in the same week on these three events. And I thought, you know, let's go for it. Let's see what happens. And, and that was um, tricky. But the hardest part about that week was um, after Badwater, my wife needed me to attend a wedding that Friday night. And uh, before the Ironman the next day. So that was, that was tricky, trying to fit shoes on and dance with my wife. I've, uh, I've heard of the last two, Badwater and like the Ironman and Lake yeah. Placid. Yeah. Uh, someone accomplishing either one of those would yeah. be like a life goal, I imagine, yeah. for, for some people. Uh, so I imagine three in one week is, is pretty difficult. It was difficult, logistically very challenging. And, um, and a wedding. And a wedding. Like a wedding. You throw a wedding in there and, and you're in different parts of the country. It was, um, it was tricky. Bad water. Uh, what are the temperatures there? No, that, that time when I did it was 132 Fahrenheit. And that's yeah. 100 miles? 135. 135 yeah. through the valley, 100 yeah. something degrees. Yeah, my, shirt, my shirt melted. Um, it was funny, this woman, Lisa Smith, who was my... Um, she got me into some of the crazy stuff. She, she's a un, ultimate badass. Uh, not not super well known. Hasn't done all the circuits on the, the podcast and stuff. But she's ultimate badass. I think I think once she had to cut her finger off in a race <laughs> to continue on. <laughs> like she's pretty yeah. tough. And so we're starting Badwater. We had just run the Vermont 100 a couple of days earlier, and she says, "Listen." Um, we have a choice. We could start early in the morning or you could start up to 10 a.m. We're going to start at 10 a.m. And I said, I don't want to start at 10 a.m. I want to get a jump start on everybody, you know? And uh, she said, no, we're going to start at 10 a.m. The temperature is supposed to be the hottest recorded temperatures in U.S. history. We're starting at 10 a.m. I said, why would we start at 10? It's going to be hot. She said, just trust me, shut up. So um, 10 a.m., we start going. She goes, slow down. We're going to walk like the first 40, 50 miles. We're going to walk it. Slow jog, walk. And I said, why would we do that? She said, because it's too hot to run. When the temperatures come down, then we'll start running. So as you can imagine, we're in last and second to last place. I'm miserable. I'm raring to go. And um, about 9 p.m. that night, 10 p.m. that night, it starts to get cooler. So it's like 110 degrees, you know? And she goes, now we can run. And sure enough, we are passing people that are 
on the side of the road, vomiting. They got to get hella vacked out, sick as a dog, quit, like unbelievable um, carnage. We are just uh, clipping people the whole way. And, and, and by the end of that night, we're in fourth and fifth place. So, you know, it's that whole tortoise in the hair um, story. Um, our shirts melted. Uh, our shoes melted. It was, um, it was brutal. Yeah, that, that is uh, crazy. <laughs> Have you ever yeah. climbed mountains? I did the mountain thing. I signed up to do um, the seven summits. Uh, we were going to set a world record. A friend and I we were going to um, summit the seven and then race to sea level. And um, the first one was Aconcagua. So I ended up doing that. It's the tallest peak in South yeah. America. I ended up doing Aconcagua. Had a great time. Um, but realized during that climb that um, climbing wasn't for me. And the reason was there's a lot of hurry up and wait. You climb, you have the base camp, you sit around. And I'm not a sit around. Like, I was losing my mind. Yeah. Just you just want to go. I just want to go. Yeah. And, and in mountain climbing, it's dangerous to just want to go. So I, I made a decision that, that yeah, I, was, I was my own worst enemy with climbing. How do you um, tell people to manufacture some of this adversity in their own life without physical exertion, right? There's, you know, you can work out, you can do these things. But if someone doesn't want to go, climb mountains, run races in 110 degree heat, but they still want to be mentally tough and challenge themselves. How do they do that? Yeah. I mean, you got to do the things you don't want to do. So if I'm looking at a bay, uh, on a sunny day, my family's on a beach and I'm looking out there and I'm like, I really don't feel like swimming that I'm afraid of sharks. It's a Sunday. And I, oh, now I got to do it. You know, my mind doesn't want to do it. Now I got to do it. I don't really feel like taking a cold shower in the morning. Oh, now I got to do it. I don't want to do my workout. Well, now I got to do it. So every so, time you think of something that you don't want to do, you I got to do, do it. it. I got to do it. And, and obviously you don't want to be ridiculous, right? You've got schedules and family and things to take care of, but like, um, you got to do the things you don't want to do. You got to understand your brain. You got to understand why your brain is, um, is trying to keep you extremely comfortable and, um, and you got to get uncomfortable. You got to live outside that comfort zone because, um, we're all going to face adversity. And the example with my mom, her mom getting cancer and dying, my mom got cancer and died. Um, shit happens in life. And, and nobody's like uh, going to avoid it. Nobody. We're all going to die. And I got to imagine that last um, day or two are pretty fucking tough for folks. So um, you practice piano, you practice math. Why don't you practice hard? Do you look at any of like uh, the science behind of what you're doing or is it mostly just driven off of fear or motivation? No, or I, I definitely look at the science and, and the reality is all these things we talk about, um, they make you better. They make you stronger, right? They make you live, they help you to live longer. So, so um, it's not just, oh, Joe wants us to be a tough guy. No, uh, I believe in something called the health span, not a lifespan, a health span. And so- um, that's great if we can get people to live to 90, but if the last 20 years they were in a hospital bed, that's not so great. That's no way to live. So what I'm trying to do is help you, um, extract the most value in the time you're here, right? We should, we should be born. We should really be able to push hard all the way through and then drop dead. Yeah. We shouldn't be living in a hospital. Last so you years. think you'll do this until whatever in life. I'm going to push through. I mean, there's so much science behind like just taking elders, putting them uh, together with their contemporaries, a bunch of other elders, putting them in a building, changing the photos to young images of themselves playing football and this and that, changing the music to what they remember. All of a sudden they start acting young. And so, um, yeah, I'm going to do it until I can't do it anymore. Who says you can't? I got, I got 90 year olds coming out and doing Spartan races. Yeah. What's the most one person's ever done? How many events? I have a guy right now that is about to hit 300 events. Yeah. Um, he is addicted. <laughs> he is hooked. Yeah, he just keeps going. Just keeps going. That's amazing. Um, what is the most challenging part now about the business? Are you guys still expanding? We're so Are fucking you... upside down. Yeah. I mean, uh, just still recovering from COVID? Still recovering from COVID. The, um, the business on a go forward basis is great. People are attending events. Everything's great. The uh, looking backwards and the, and the scorched earth of the last uh, 
36 months and what, what we got put through of just shutting down this machine. Well, I lost $50 million. So, you know, in the 22 years of doing this, we didn't make $50 million. So, um, this has been, this has been my own, um, manufactured adversity, right? My own test. Yeah. How do you lose $50 million? Um, well, you, uh, have 400 plus thousand people sign up for a race. You then give them a new free race, but that's not enough because they want to kill you. So you give them two free races. That's $90 million right there. And then you, um, continue to pay people for two plus years that work for you, even though you can't put on events, uh, because you don't know if the next two weeks we're going to be able to put on events again. So you're operating in 40 plus countries, but you can't operate. You can't sell tickets. Um, you burn $50 million. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like a logistical nightmare. Nightmare. Yeah. Nightmare. Did you keep people on the entire time during COVID? We did. We furloughed a lot, but um, we kept about 150 on the entire time. Yeah. That was important to you? Well, it was important, number one, because these are people you love and you work with. You want to keep everybody. But um, it's also important because what if next week the world opens up? We only know now that it was going to take. We didn't. Back then, it was like, this can't go on another week. This can't go on two more weeks. We'll be putting on events in no time. Never ended. Yeah. Initially, it seemed like uh, they were saying two weeks, right? Three weeks, four weeks, five weeks. And then it just kept going. Just kept going. going. Yeah. Um, You did a show on CNBC, right? What what was that all about? How did that work? Yeah. So it was basically, Joe, could you take businesses and put them through what you put individuals through, right? You've been doing business a long time. And um, could you help transform those businesses by putting them, you know, through a vice grip on the farm? We have a farm as I described earlier on the, in Vermont. And so uh, we took a bunch of companies up there one at a time and I got to do what I do best, which is just dunk people in cold water and torture them and all in an effort to get them to wake up and transform. And what's on this farm? So it's a 700 acre farm in, in the middle of Vermont, dead center of Vermont. And um, we had goats and chickens and cows and all those things. Uh, not so much anymore. Uh, now we've got 50 miles of trails and cabins and, um, I get veterans and all kinds of folks, companies, uh, the Nikes, the Googles, the Facebooks all go up there and, um, and put their people through the paces. Yeah. So team building is, it's kind of what you were saying earlier, right? Instead of going to dinner with someone, you do this it's and exactly you have right. unbreakable we, bond, right? We, we torture people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's next? Well, my dream, once I get fully through COVID, my dream is to, um, is to have a full featured, um, movie. Um, I wrote a book, uh, a fiction book on ancient Sparta and, um, I love Batman begins my favorite movie ever. And I'd, I'd love to, uh, create a whole series, um, all in an effort. I mean, my goal is to change a hundred million lives. So that movie would be just another way to get people off the couch and motivated. Where do you think you're job. at now with a hundred million? I, I've changed 10 million lives so far. I got 90 to go. 90 to go. 10% of the way there. 10% of the way there. If I hit a hundred, I get a free pass to heaven. <laughs> I think you're already there. Um, all right, cool. What do you think about uh, diet? Well, I think fitness starts in the kitchen. Yeah. I think um, there's definitely a whole school of people that are uh, eating livers and eyeballs and, and meat nonstop. Is that bullshit? The liver um, king thing and all well, of that? I mean, I would argue, I always think back to, um, I always think back to what it was like, you know, 500 years ago, 10,000 years ago. And I think- there were certain areas in the world and the plains for like, maybe we didn't have uh, vegetables and fruit, you know, so we had to kill animals to eat. So um, you do that for 20 generations, 50 generations, hundred generations, like that DNA probably performs really well on that food. The Alaskan um, Eskimo probably performs really well on, on that kind of food. Right. So it really depends. I would think just logically where you're from, I know for me, I perform best on more salad and less, I think we all perform less on, uh, I think we all perform better on less processed, but um, I haven't tried because my mother was vegan. I haven't tried the all meat thing. And I am, I am curious. I'm, I'm probably going to do a week or two. I just want to see, even though I'm, I'm not a big meat eater, I, I just want to see how I feel. And you think that's really just because your body's gotten used to it at this point and, and you know that you perform well on it, you feel good on it, you, you well, just Well, I mean, that? just think about, think about Darwin, right? And think about, um, you know, use it or lose it and, and the whole way we evolve. If I have to be right, on, on, right? This is, this is logical that if, if there's an area on earth where um, descended upon descended upon descendant mostly ate meat, 
uh, those that didn't perform well on it died off. Those that perform well um, thrived, and and you just continue and and so you would imagine that a descendant from that line would do well on meat versus somebody that just ate salad versus somebody that just ate fish. Now we are a mixed bunch. We've been you know populating with each other, so maybe you know it's not perfect. Um, but one thing we could all agree on, one thing we could all agree on is less boxed food, less, less processed food. Yeah. So, but I, I am going to test the meat thing. I'm, I'm curious. It feels like, um, sleep should be talked about more than it is. Mm. Do you agree with that? My whole life I've said, um, I'll sleep when I'm dead. But, um, but lately, you know, I, I did this Tony Robbins thing. I, 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 um, he's got this, this company called Fountain Life. Okay. They did a whole uh, day. It's like twenty thousand dollars, and uh, they didn't charge me. They did a whole uh, CAT scan, MRI, blood, artificial intelligence, and um, and they said, "Man, you're really low on omega threes." So thank God that that was what came out of it. It wasn't. I mean, they they find things. Yeah, you know, a guy that did it the same week I did. They said, "Dude, you got can- kidney cancer. We got to cut your kidney out like right now." Shit. Um, because when you find out you have kidney cancer, it's too late. You're dead. So um. So anyway, they found out that I'm I'm really low in omega threes, and I started taking them like three weeks ago. My dreams are unbelievable, like ridiculous. Um, I'm having so much fun with the dreams. <laughs> I'm actually enjoying You're trying to sleep more. I'm, now. I'm enjoying the sleep, but um, you know, I guess the way I look, I have so much fun in life, even when it sucks. That um. I just want to be awake. Yeah. But of, of course I believe in recovery. Um, you know, I'm an investor in the aura ring. I got in very, very early and I obviously love the science behind being able to track your sleep and being able to track, um, your performance and your heart rate and, and, um, you name it. Right. The problem I have with it is, um, I don't want to know that I had a shitty night's sleep. Like, I don't want to be carrying that throughout the day or, oh, I got it. I'm tired. Like, you know what I mean? Most of my life, it's been like, yeah, hey, I had a rough night, but. So the argument to that would be um, that it tells you when you're more likely to get injured, right? Is what they'll say. Mm. You don't want to know that? Like, if you wake up, you had a shitty night of sleep, you worked yep. out hard the day before, your recovery is low, they'll basically be like, okay, you're more likely to get injured today if you do the same level of workout or something higher or more difficult. My response to that is, um, you and I are in the plains, we're hunting. Yeah. You don't have a choice. We're hungry. Yeah. And I'm like, oh man, look at that deer. We haven't eaten in two days. You're like, can't do it. Or a ring says, I had a shitty night last night, we run the risk of getting hurt. We'll eat tomorrow. Come on. You, no you know choice. what I mean? We got we, yeah. we you got to fight through. So like, think about all those times in your life where you fought through, and the only bad work I've, I've ever had is the one I don't do. So, um, and now now if I'm competing at a high level in some sport, and the ring tells me I had I'm not recovered, what am I going to do? Not compete? You know, like so I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, so um, Patrick Mahomes wears uh, the whoop on his sleeve when he plays, right? Yep. And I think the thought behind that is uh, you don't have a choice, but maybe if you can prepare a little bit better uh, beforehand. He's in a certain, he's well, in a different circumstance, I well, would argue. No, I, w- I would argue actually the ring, the whoop, all these things are very valuable f- for a moment. Yeah. But, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm just making an argument for me. I'm not yeah, making it right. And I'm just saying I learned, oh, you're getting shitty night's sleep because you leave your phone on, knucklehead. You're getting shitty night's sleep because you you leave light in the room. Oh, it, the temperature's not right. So once I made all those adjustments and now I see I get good sleep, I don't need that anymore now, right? But maybe, I don't know, maybe every six months you do a tune-up and you just check. Um, yeah. It was funny. We were living in Japan and I had the ring and, um, and my sleep was terrible. And I didn't know my wife is a maniac. She's got on her phone a shark attack tracker and an earthquake tracker. So every day somewhere there's like a little tremor and there's some shark attack somewhere. And so her phone is beeping. It's waking me up. My ring is saying I'm getting shitty nights, but I didn't, I didn't know that was happening. So it was valuable in that respect. Yeah. And have you changed that since? <laughs> changed that since, since yes. <laughs> There's no more. There's uh, no more. Yeah. No more of that. Earthquakes and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, amazing. All right. So last question is, uh, if you had to start over, 
you had to go back and, and uh, redo all of this life in general, business, everything like that, would you do anything differently? Yes, I would do some things differently. <clears throat> I would definitely be more patient. As you can tell, just sitting across from me, I'm, I'm impatient. I'm always getting after. So I would have, life is short, but it, but it's, it's longer than you think. So, um, so I'd definitely be more patient with the kids. Uh, I would have put them all in gymnastics for the first eight years of their life. Why? Um, for anybody listening who has kids or is about to have kids, if they're young, my belief now after raising four kids is um, gymnastics creates incredible body awareness, incredible strength, no risk of injury. You're not lifting weights. You're just using body weight, um, becoming really coordinated. And then when they're like seven, eight years old, I would put them in every possible sport. They would, they would play seven, eight sports if they can, everything. And I would do that for like three years. Now they're 11 and 12. They're coordinated. You got a chance to see what sport they excel at. And then I would go all in. And in a perfect world, if you have four kids like me, you put them all in the same sport. Um, not because you want to take anything away from any one of them, but because the family can't handle effectively going in four different directions every day. Just can't, you just can't do it. Everybody suffers a little bit, especially the parents. So, um, and is that the same thing as to why they wouldn't play three sports, right? Say they get to high school and they want to play football, basketball, and baseball, uh, a son. Is, there's just, there's a lot going on and it's a lot of stress on the family. Um, yeah. some of the best moments I found as far as, I mean, you seem like a guy that thinks about optimizing a life and, um, you've got to optimize a family life too. And in Japan, for example, when we lived there, there was this club we were part of and, um, it was like seven stories. And every story had like one was basketball, one was swimming, one. And so there, in that case, you could do three sports because after school, the kids went and at this time was swimming and that time was like, that makes sense. Yeah. So you give a hundred percent of your effort to one thing rather than 70% to yeah, three different things. Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, is that it? Gymnastics and, and sports. Would they play tackle football? No, my boys now wrestle and okay. my girls play soccer. So they, that's their one. And they, and they would all wrestle if I had my choice, but. Yeah. And why wrestling? I stumbled upon wrestling. Uh, it's a crazy story. I had a Kung Fu master living with us, which is an, another whole crazy story. Um, on the farm, when the kids were very young, I convinced my wife to allow us to hire a Kung Fu master, to, uh, which was our form of gymnastics, right? They did Kung Fu. And, um, and I met this guy who was a wrestler. And he said, you know, I grew up with a, next to a Green Beret, the dad, had two uh, boys. They were my friends. My friend is telling me. And um, the boys had to wrestle in the dark in the basement every night after dinner for an hour and a half, religiously for a decade. It got so weird that people were calling social services, but blindfolded in the dark, in the basement, every night after dinner. And the theory was from the Green Beret dad, um, if they could wrestle in the dark, they'd kill it in the light. Fast forward, one of them becomes a coach at Stanford University, wrestling coach. Uh, while he's there, he um, brings other uh, neighborhood wrestlers, other wrestlers, club wrestlers into the room because he wants to mix it up for his wrestlers, his Stanford wrestlers. One of those kids one night says, coach, I got nowhere to sleep tonight. I got locked out of my apartment. Can I sleep on the mat? Coach says, don't be ridiculous. Take, take my apartment. I'm going out with my buddies tonight. Coach says, remember the coach is one of the two brothers that trained in the basement, right? Yep. For 10 years. Um, here's the keys to my apartment, stay on the couch. I'll be, I'll be in, you know, midnight or whatever. Coach comes home, uh, goes into his room, goes to bed, sees the, the guy on the couch, 2 AM door to his bedroom opens up. Guy's got a gun. going to kill the coach. Random act of violence, uh, strips the coach down to his underwear, zip ties his legs to the chair, zip ties his hands behind his back, pillowcase over his head, press the, revol the revolver to his head. And, um, the coach says, uh, can you do me a favor? Can you shut the lights before you pull the trigger? Um, because he trained in the dark for 10 years, right? Um, perpetrator obliges him, shuts the lights. Coach uh, headbutts him, somehow disarms him while tied to this chair, pins him on the ground, calls... None of this is believable. Calls 911 from behind his back. Stanford police break the door down, come in. Looks like a scene from Pulp Fiction. Blood on the ground. Guy tied to a chair with a pillowcase over his head. Perpetrator. Um, 
I immediately got the boys into wrestling. After that, we got rid of the Kung Fu master. And I was like, if a wrestler can do that, we are wrestlers. We sign them up. Yeah. yeah. That's so, insane. So the boys wrestle now. That's amazing. That's yeah. a great story. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having me. Where can we send people to to read more about yeah. you, about Spartan? Well, anybody could always email me, joe at spartan.com. I've given my email to the entire world. You could find me at Real Joe Descent on Instagram, wherever, you know, all the other nonsense. Um, we've got books out there. Uh, if anybody wants to go to a race, if I were you, if I were you, we've got races coming up in Florida. Um, I would take a bunch of free entries from me. I would get your entire audience. That's a Florida audience to, or from anywhere in the country. If you want, it's on me, uh, to run with you, one of our events. And I promise you, um, that audience will be uh, fly paper for you'll be so, um, connected to them that whatever you're doing in business will, will tend to be stuck listening to me forever, forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's, uh, let's, let's do that. Uh, but thank you so much for doing this and we'll do it again soon. My pleasure.